From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. Lockbit has a weird week. Feds warn of DMARC sneak and Newberger wants operations tweak. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have selected from this past week's cybersecurity headlines. On the, on the clothing rack of news, we've looked around, we found the bargains, we tried some things on, some things didn't fit quite right, we put them back, but we made the proper selections. And now we're ready for some insight, opinion, and expertise from our guest, Sasha Pereira, the CISO over at WASH. Sasha, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate your time, and uh, I can't wait to get into the news with you. Same, likewise. All right, before we move on into that news, I want to spend a second and thank our sponsor for today, Vanta, compliance that doesn't suck too much. Join us over on YouTube Live. To do so, go to CISOseries.com, hit the events drop down, and look for the cybersecurity headlines week in review image. Just click on it to join us, and you'll be in on all the fun. Once you're there, you can contribute your comments in our chat. We want comments. We want questions. We want opinion. I'll dare I say some hot takes. We'll do our best to address them during the show. I'm already seeing uh, some threads uh, blowing up here, uh, so I can't wait to get into all of that. We've got about 20 minutes, though, so let's get it going. First up here, what a big one for this week. This just kept developing throughout the week. Lock, lock, Lockbit's website is back, but not how you'd think. We covered three stories about Lockbit this week. Uh, you know, uh, hard to believe they're ever far from our minds and indeed our hearts. First, the FBI and Europol uh, had some fun at Lockbit's expense using the gang's seize site to post content about uh, with their own press releases, information about the hackers, just having, I guess, uh, some kicks there. At about the same time, the Department of Justice unsealed charges against a Russian national, Dmitry Koroshev, who's accused of developing and administrating Lockbit ransomware. Not to be outdone, though, Lockbit claimed credit for an attack on Wichita, Kansas, which has become the 38th municipality in the U.S. to suffer a ransomware attack. All right, so Sasha, we've got a couple of questions here. I, I, first off, what do you make of the strategy about using Lockbit C sites to poke fun uh, at them? Are, are they poking the bear there? Do you think these can have any impact on either uh, either on the criminal side or maybe regular people? You know, kind of giving some confidence that hey, law enforcement is uh, is is actually making some progress here. I'm curious, what do you think? Um, sure. I think by taking control of, you know, Lockbit, the, the gang's website, I think just, you know, putting official enforcement content on there. Um, I think a lot of the government agencies are sending a pretty strong message to, you know, Lockbit or, or any other cyber criminals as well. It serves, you know, as a reminder that, you know, illicit activities, um, you know, are going to face consequences. Um, and for the second piece you mentioned, for regular people, um, I think it instills confidence, right? So seeing law enforcement taking action um, or, you know, repurposing their websites, I think it really boosts the confidence, you know, in, in the efforts that they made. Um, I think, you know, it, it shows that um, officials are, you know, doing something to protect individuals and businesses from online threats. Um, and so this would encourage people to take cybersecurity more seriously, right? Like strong passwords and keeping their software updated. Well, and I think it also gives some veracity when, whether it's CISA or DOJ or Europol or whoever comes out and, and is and is giving, you know, cybersecurity advice and not just from their authority as a law enforcement agency, but hey, we know how to, you know, beat the bad guys. I feel like when you're when you're talking to normal, you know, to 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 everyday people that maybe aren't in the trenches with cybersecurity, that adds a little bit more weight to that for sure. No, it does. And especially coming from the government again, it's a, it's a, it's a huge step, I think, that I've seen in the past being in IT for like a really long time. Something like this really people take a lot more seriously, especially when you have the CISA that, you know, you're, you have an organization that's dedicated to keeping people informed and, you know, it's relevant and new information as well, right? The uh, the other side, though, here, you know, this Wichita story, we we saw uh, in the news this week that the city, you know, can't accept like, uh, you know, debit or credit card transactions for city services, having to move back to cash and check there. Uh, obviously, this is not as big of an attack on something like a paralyzing attack on New York City. But, you know, Wichita is the biggest city in the state, certainly, uh, you know, a, a major uh, metropolitan area. I'm curious with these types of attacks, what is, I guess, the geopolitical uh, uh angle here that we should be concerned about, right? Lockbit, uh, you know, is, is very strongly believed uh, to be based out of Russia. Uh, uh, obviously, a lot of the groups there have ties back, uh, uh, you know, to state power there. I, I'm curious, you know, how, how should we maybe look at it from maybe a geopolitical lens about what these groups are trying to do by attacking cities like this? Um, I think, uh, 
initially to kind of this focus on the fact that it's, you know, it's uh, attacks on municipalities, right? Um, you know, small towns, like you mentioned, like Wichita, you know, there definitely have political ramifications, right? Um, I think it's it impacts the uh, public perception of the current government's administration's ability to address uh, challenges. Mm-hmm. You know, that's every ransomware attack, right? Regardless of uh, size of the affected municipality, it basically highlights the vulnerabilities um, in the cybersecurity infrastructure, right? It raises uh, questions about the government's ability to protect critical systems and services, no matter how small they are. Um, If these sort of attacks persist, you know, or escalate, uh, it's going to create this perception, right, that the administration is not effectively addressing cybersecurity threats, which in turn could erode public confidence. Right. Um, And as with any major issue affecting public, right, there's always a potential for political accountability. Um, If ransomware attacks on these municipalities, whether it's small or larger, continue to occur without significant improvements in cybersecurity defenses, um, you know, the current administration is going to face criticism for not taking sufficient action to protect local governments and communities. Yeah, I always think of... um you know, are you better off? The classic political question, are you better off than you were last year? It's like, well, I can't pay for my water bill, right? And so like, I need to blame somebody for that. I'm not saying it makes sense to whether you're blaming a mayor, a governor, a president, you know, something like that. But like people, like that's a natural psychological reaction. So yeah, definitely always something to keep in mind. uh, Sure. For sure. Uh, Next up here, feds warn about North Korean exploitation of improperly configured DMARC. The FBI, the NSA, and the State Department, one of my favorite triumvirates, published a joint advisory last week stating that attackers from North Korea's Kimsuki operation are targeting improperly configured DNS domain-based message authentication, reporting, and conformance, otherwise known as DMARC, record policies. After identifying email systems whose DMARC is improperly configured, The group then prepares and sends convincing spear phishing emails, which appear to have been sent from a legitimate domain. So, Sasha, DMARC is supposed to authenticate email messages to avoid spoofing. Clearly looks uh, like an avoidable situation. I'm I'm curious, do you have confidence in DMARC generally? And if so, what should organizations do to ensure it's properly configured? So DMARC, again, has been around for a pretty long time, right? Yeah. It's one of those things that back in the day when I was a systems administrator, uh, you know, making sure that was one of the first few things that I set up before security was a big thing. It's just mm-hmm. properly configuring your email servers, right? Improperly configured DMARC records can leave you completely vulnerable to phishing attacks, right? Um, my my thoughts on it are a little bit, uh, you know, I would say, you need to implement SPF and DKIM, right? So D- DMARC basically works in conjunction with your center policy framework and your domain key, uh, keys, which, you know, identified mail. You need those two work together with DMARC and you need to have those, all of those three working together, right? So I think what's really key is organizations should ensure that your SPF, DKIM are properly configured for the domains to maximize the effectiveness of DMARC. Um, another piece that I think has worked really well for me in the past as well with my previous firms as well as my current is regularly review and update. I think that's the piece that's really, really rough, right? It's really important to organizations to regularly review and update their DMARC configs to adapt to evolving threats and changes. Um, You know, it could be just uh, certain configuration changes that you made maybe 10 years ago. Uh, It's one of those things where you said to have set it up, I've configured it, let's just leave it. And I think that's where a lot of firms need to include that in their quarterly or whether monthly checkups to make sure that the configurations are accurate and, you know, current. Yeah. It's one of those things that's so table stakes when it comes to not even email security, like email infrastructure, right? It's easy to make that uh, kind of a checkbox. And David Cross brings up a a great point, uh, you know, kind of regarding that spear phishing angle of it. Uh, He says at RSA this week, uh, many shared examples of how AI is being used for more targeted spear phishing emails as well. I know that's but was like the one of the first concerns when these Gen AI systems came online, but uh, uh, getting some more solid, uh, uh, I guess, research and and some more solid awareness about how that is being used, uh, I think is definitely going to be uh, useful to stay on top of uh, for sure. So thank you for that, David. Uh, next up here, NSC's new burger suggests operational approach for mitigating cyber attacks. In an interview with Click Here, a podcast from Recorded Future News, uh, we we use those folks all the time for stories and stuff. Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technologies and Newberger suggests that more should be done now to build cybersecurity into an organization's daily operations. Describing how much of the focus is on restoration, as in 
How quickly can an attacked hospital or pipeline recover from an attack? She says, now more than ever, the process must shift to having the right operational risk measures to ensure we're taking the right steps. So as an example, she highlights uh, something like a pipeline. Uh, or she highlights with a pipeline the network connecting the traditional corporate part and the operational part that controls gas flow needs to have separations so that a hacker hacking somebody's email can't disrupt an oil pipeline. From a threat perspective, she highlights the change in China's cyber operations, shifting from espionage and stealing national secrets or, or uh, you know, um, IP or something like that, to pre-positioning in critical services like water systems and pipeline systems. So a big old read there, but Ann Neuberger appears to be focusing on greater proactivity in how companies manage risk and uses a great parallel by showing what threat actors are doing to embed themselves in the infrastructure rather than just stealing stuff. I mean, really at a very fundamental level, seeing advanced actors changing tactics. Uh, a lot there, Sasha. What do you think about this? So this was a really, really great article. Um, some of my peers and I have been sort of throwing out these ideas for a while, right? Um, I think one of the key pieces of the article that I wanted to you know, mention about was the segmentation and separation, right? So she gave an example of separating, as you mentioned, network, the network corporate and operational parts, you know, such as pipelines and and splitting it off, right? And not keeping your email logins or your some. I think by isolating critical systems from less secure networks, you know, you can limit the ability of attackers to move laterally and that and disrupt essential services, right? Um, I mean, it, it could be, you see a lot of the other hacks that have happened in the last year, including one of the big casinos, which we all have heard about, right? And once the attackers got into their IAM, they were able to go anywhere. And I know it's, it sounds like it could be more work, but you have to think about like operationally, you need to separate it, right? So I have put this in place and a couple of other firms as well is I've separated my IAMs for my core business services, right? So mm -hmm. whether it's, uh, you know, Duo that got hacked last week, right? Uh, or any other IAM, Okta for that matter, you need to keep some of the operational pieces that or your business depends on on a separate IAM. Uh, and segregating that, although it can seem a lot of work, you got to think about it is once you get in on the IAM, what's going to happen after that? And so I, I do like the piece that she mentioned about segment, you know, segmenting your network and specifically on the identity part, because we're seeing that happen all over the board. It's not the, it's not the, um, you know, getting and installing ransomware on your machine or, or, you know, it's the first piece, the identity. And if you separate your identity, your, you know, all of us as CISOs in the community have this thing where we want to unify and have a single pane of dashboard and we want to have one <laughs> system and you get into everything. And no one sit back a little bit and thought about that. Is that a good idea? Right. Yeah, it's a little Battlestar Galactica uh, kind of, uh, you know, we don't want the we don't want the robots getting access to all the networks uh, a little bit there. <laughs> but, I, you know, th that is that is a really great point. Now, is uh, just very quickly, I know I, I think every CISO hearing these kind of statements like, yes, we need to separate out this, these operational aspects of that. How does that translate into how do I talk about this to the business? Because that is a big lift, right? This isn't green. You know, you're not doing this. This is an existing infrastructure. That's a that's can be a heavy lift. How do you start, I guess, just very quickly, how do you start that conversation with the biz with other stakeholders in the business? Sure. I'll give you an example. One of my peers, right? It was uh, when United Healthcare got hit, right? And it took down billing systems for a lot of different... Um, I used that case with my, uh, with my C-suite, right? I explained to them, hey... Um, when the United Films billing systems goes down, you basically cannot effectively bill anyone. And I think giving those real examples, although as horrible as it was for people who work for United and every other you know, insurance company that had those issues, we have to use those as talking points with our C-suite because that's what they understand. Every C-suite, every person in my C-suite reads the Wall Street Journal, right? And sees all these articles come in. So you have to use that to your advantage. And you basically explain them like, hey, this has happened to us. And what would you rather prefer? Would you rather prefer we have this on a separated or would you be down for three days? Well, uh, in a related vein, our next story here, cancer patient data exposed for five years gets copied by unidentified third parties. California-based Gardened Health is now busy alerting patients that information related to samples collected in late 2019 and 2020 which math tells me is five years ago, was inadvertently exposed online to the general public after an employee mistakenly uploaded. Gardent is a supplier of testing services to physicians and hospitals, meaning that patients were not aware that this company had anything to do with them, probably a name that they had never heard of before. Uh, you know, as a result, a lot of a lot of unpack here, you know, the obligation of uh, third party vendors to take accountability for the data that they manage, the obligation of healthcare providers to be more transparent, and perhaps the fact that the data stayed exposed for so long. 
I'm curious, isn't there ways, you know, for, for testing something like this, I guess, you know, Sasha, a lot of angles here, where would you like to go with it? Yeah, definitely a lot. I think you covered a majority of the ones that I was saying, right? There's, there's so many things, it's third party vendor accountability. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, a transparency in healthcare, right? I think that's one of the pieces that's really strikes me as a big one for this. And this is for our everyday user, you know, it's like, we do not really think about what information we're giving when we go, when we deal with anything space healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, do, you do go to like Quest Diagnostics and you, you just give up all your information there without even thinking twice. You give your social security, you give your fingerprint, anything you can, you don't even think about it. I think that piece is where I think there needs to be a little bit more transparency in healthcare, right? Patients have a right to know how their personal information is being handled and to be informed in the event of a data breach, right? Um, I think it's an obligation for them to notify individuals about the breach, right? And the need for greater transparency in healthcare. And I think it extends beyond healthcare. I mean, the at t data breach in 2021, I mean, we only found out about it this year, because the results were leaked to the dark web. I mean, I was I was part of that breach as well. I mean, I mm -hmm. had to I had to put in you know three different locks and all the trans credit bureaus. But I feel that account, the notification and the fact that the transparency in where your data is, I think, is really really key, right? Um, and I feel that the fact that this data remained exposed for such an extended period of time, I think that raises concerns about the effectiveness of monitoring and detection. Right, um, which we we hear about this a lot, right? Hackers are in your systems. The mean time to detect a hack is a is a year. So, I just feel like the monitoring piece and regular security audits to collect, you know, potential vulnerabilities needs to be more prompt. Yeah, and that kind of goes back uh, just even to the DMARC story uh, that we were talking about, uh, and along those lines for sure. All right, before we move on to our next story, I have to spend a few moments and thank our sponsor for today, Vanta. Are lengthy security reviews pulling attention away from your security program? With the largest network of trust centers, Vanta can help you streamline security reviews to win customer trust, save time, and close deals fast. Proactively demonstrate security by showcasing key resources like your SOC 2 or ISO 2701 and provide real-time evidence for passing controls. And when a security questionnaire is required, Vanta takes the first pass for you. Visit vanta.com slash CISO to take a tour. All right, next up here, gift card fraud ring targets retailers' employees. A warning from the FBI regarding Storm 0539, a financially motivated hacking group that targets the mobile devices of retail department staff using a phishing kit that enables them to bypass multi-factor authentication. After stealing the login credentials of a gift card department personnel, the group seeks out SSH passwords and keys uh, which along with employee PII can be sold online. They then use compromised employee accounts to generate fraudulent gift cards. Uh, you know, a, a bit of a buried leader, I guess, with this story, a phishing kit that enables them to bypass multi-factor authentication. Uh, isn't that what we're, what the rush to do MFA was, was all about, right? Uh, the, the halcyon days when we, we thought this would solve all of our, uh, our all of our access problems. Uh, secondly, uh, this definitely is a social engineering story, not direct customer data theft, which is, I think, another interesting point here. Both of these seem much more serious than just being about gift cards. Uh, Sasha, what are your thoughts here? I agree 100%. I think the title of this news story should have been Bypassing MFA Through Man in the Middle Attack. Right. Um, and uh, the reason I mentioned that is it's it's an assumption a little bit from, a you know, because they call this the phishing kit. Right. But, you know, man the middle attacks are getting really, really sophisticated. Um, I mean, it's getting sophisticated to the point that, you know, Microsoft has launched a very specific targeted piece of entry that detects things like that. Right. MITM attacks can target various communication channels. Right. It's web browsing, email, instant messaging, um, VoIP, um, even your wireless networks. Right. Um, and so this kind of, you know, allows attackers to exploit your vulnerabilities across different platforms, right? Um, I mean, in response to these threats, right, organizations should prioritize employee training, which we all, you know, have heard about this every time again, but <laughs> also implementing robust access controls and monitoring systems, right? I think those are really key at this point in stage because threat actors are getting extremely sophisticated in their attacks. And I feel like even though this was focused on gift cards, I think this is a really, a, a very largely growing thing this year because we've heard of man in the middle attacks for a while, but the fact that you're able to exploit them without 
yearly even, you know, stealing on MFA tokens is one of them, right? Um, that's growing a lot. I mean, I'm seeing it across the board and, you know, it's not just gift cards. I feel is a small piece. I think this this article needs a lot more coverage than it has. Yeah, it, it, well, that's one of those things where the, the MFA bypass stories are approaching where ransomware was, I don't know, four years ago, right? Where we have to like reconsider it needs to be more notable than just someone did an MFA bypass. And I, and I think this gift card story had a, a, a lot of interesting elements in it that we wanted to make sure we covered it. But yeah, it's it's becoming so commonplace. And, you know, it's always, you know, that's how you identify where the perimeter, right, is where people are getting creative and, and trying to find a way around it. Um, but yes, definitely. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, they're going to like Fido base to like, you know, passkey, just start using passkeys. I mean, MFA honestly is yesteryear. If someone <laughs> says, well, I'm protecting my organization by MFA, I'm like, okay, that was, <laughs> and... that was a long time ago, right? I mean, if you're not doing MFA, that would be really bad. But yeah, for definitely like using passkeys or Fido2 or just doing continuous monitoring, right? Um, starting to put in multiple things at that level, because again, as I mentioned earlier, and one of the things you mentioned, the, the bulk of the attacks is now an identity. Whether you look at um, the MGM hack, whether you look at the uh, the Citrix piece on United Healthcare, right? You look at the duo, it's all in the identity. It's like that first step. And it's it's worth putting, you know, a lot of our efforts in that piece right now because gone are the days where someone sends you something and installs the software in your machine and then takes over your computer. I mean, yes, ransomware still is still around, but the identity piece is where it's at today. All right, and our last story for today, CISA is moving the needle on vulnerability remediation. Hey, we're going to finish up with some good news. Who knew it occasionally happens? CISA launched its ransomware vulnerability warning pilot in January 2023 and has issued 1,754 warning notices to entities with vulnerable internet accessible devices in its first year. The agency said that nearly half of these notifications resulted in organizations either patching, briefly taking systems offline to fix the issue, or otherwise mitigating exploitable flaws. And then we also have the known exploited vulnerabilities report, which the agency has introduced since 2021. It's also speeding up vulnerability remediation times. The KEV is designed to notify government agencies and enterprises of high-risk threats in the wild. And BitSight reports that critical KVEs are remediated 2.6 times faster than non-KEV threats, while high-severity KE, uh, KEVs are fixed 1.8 times faster. Nonprofits and NGOs are the slowest to remediate, while tech companies and insurance and financial firms, which are highly targeted, are getting the fastest. So, Sasha, two bits of good news regarding uh, proactive mm -hmm. defenses from CISA. Hey, uh, do these achievements make you feel good or do we, should we contextualize this? Hey, this is a drop in the cybersecurity ocean. Um, well, I think it's in the piece just mentioned, right? I mean, the fact that critical KVs are remediated 2.6 times faster and high severity is what is 1.8, I think, mm -hmm. um, the non care I mean, that that itself is saying that this is working, right? Um, I mean, it's true. You know, I've, I've worked for a couple of nonprofits pro bono in the past, right? And NGOs, are, they're slow to remediate, right? Um, of course, tech companies with insurance and financial firms are quicker, right? <laughs> um, I mean, that's kind of like expected, right? But uh, the disparities in remediation times, right? Although kind of like uh, undermine the importance of resources and cybersecurity awareness across different types of organizations, right? I mean, yes, in the grand scheme of things, right? Uh, these initiatives are just a merely a drop in the ocean. Um, but, you know, they represent a, a concerted effort, right, to manage and mitigate cyber risks. Um, I mean, the cybersecurity landscape is vast. So, you know, if it's a drop in the ocean, it's all those drops make it up, right? So I think there's always more work to be done. But I, I do, I am really happy to see that, you know, they're making a pretty conscious effort to, um, you know, kind of contribute to that. So I'm, I'm always in favor of it. Yeah. And when I see these, I also think like, okay, CISA is learning how to successfully make frameworks that speak to government and, you know, which traditionally extraordinarily slow, or we, we at least associate with being slow and large enterprises, again, not known necessarily for being like the most agile uh, uh, organizations out there. So, you, you know, building up these frameworks of, okay, hey, this is, this is working. We have data points now to be like, let's see what vulnerabilities are getting patched super quick. How do you know how how can we iterate on this? This is not a fixed thing. Let's iterate. Let's expand on that. Like that to me is the encouraging thing too. Yes, this is one year, but let's figure out. Okay, these are these are the tools that people are actually responding to instead of like name and shame and stuff like that. Like that. I mean, you know, it's yeah. really good that they're doing it too, right? Rich, because again, nonprofits and NGOs don't have those massive budgets, right? Exactly, that financial yeah. and 
healthcare firms have. I mean, you know, you you have like a single IT director who's running all of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and so it's it's hard for them. Like, so any help they can get without having to pay for it, I think, is really really key. And I, I really am am proud that they're doing it. All right. Well, Sasha, before we get out of here, is there any story that was a big thumbs up or an eye roller for you? Uh, something you reacted strongly to in the rundown today? I got to give the gift thumbs up to the gift card one. I think the the the, the man in the middle attack and the phishing, the the kind of the sophisticated phishing attacks, I think mm. is really, really key. Most of the other ones were also really good, but I really wanted to highlight that because I felt like it was played down a little bit and I wanted to give it my thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Sasha Pereira, the CISO at Wash, for your expertise, your time. Uh, just knocking out of the park today. This is just a, a I, I could go a, an extra hour on any one of these stories. This is just fantastic. Where can people find you online uh, if they're so inclined? Uh, LinkedIn, probably the best. So LinkedIn is Sasha W. Pereira. Excellent. We will have that linked in our show notes. And thank you once again, Sasha. The, just a uh, phenomenal time. Anyway, thank you so much. Thanks also to our sponsor for today, Vanta. Compliance that doesn't suck too much. And a big thank you to our audience today. Uh, I see Sean Kelly. I'm doing romper room now. I see Sean. I see Michael. I see, you know, uh, a how to IT guru was had some great points about uh, DMARC uh, being table stakes there. Sorry, we could not get to all of your comments here today. Uh, and David Cross and everybody that's joining us in our chat, helping make the show a little more lively, a little more fun. Really appreciate it. Remember, you can always join us every single Friday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Get in on the chat. We would love to have you here. Just a reminder, there will be no Super Cyber Friday next week because we'll be airing the Capture the CISO finals live at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. So in the same time slot, it's hosted by me. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, doing my first Capture the CISO finals. And the competition is to win the love of our distinguished judges uh, and you do not want to miss it and see which vendor will emerge victorious. Uh, just a reminder, if you're looking for more great live stream content, our own David Spark, the big boss man himself, is going to be on Daily Tech News Show right after this show. So 4 p.m. Eastern, talking all about the news from RSA. If you're watching live, and I know some of you are because I see you in the chat, uh, you can head on over to dailytechnewsshow.com slash live to catch the stream. Otherwise, just look for Daily Tech News Show in your podcast app of choice and listen later. We still have another week in review show, uh, 3.30 uh, every single week. So join us for that. And remember, in the meantime, you can get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines every single day. Give us about six minutes. We'll get you all caught up. Until the next time we meet, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 